Hi, I'm Cheryl Belson with American Sewing Guild, and I am so excited to be joined today by Marcy Harriel. Marcy describes herself as an actress, and a singer and a dancer and she is also known to those of us in the sewing community by her alter ego name Una Baluna. She is an enthusiastic and colorful sewist and to steal her own words she's an all-around merrymaker. I personally became acquainted with Marcy several years ago as a blogger for Mood Fabrics and from my first introduction to Marcy until now I've always found exposure to her to bring a smile to my face and to often bring a much needed jolt of laughter and inspiration. So Marcy pushes all the boundaries with her enthusiastic and colorful sewing. Marcy, welcome to this episode of American Sewing Guild's Fireside Chats. I'm so thrilled that you offered to do this interview. Cheers and welcome. Cheers. Thank you so much. I'm blushing like this rosé after that. Thank you. <laughs> well, Marcy, I always love to hear how people got started on their sewing journeys from, from the time of being introduced to sewing to where they are today. And I understand that your journey started when you were packing your belongings and your cats, apparently, in your car to go move to uh, Los Angeles. And apparently a dear friend of yours gave you a piece of advice. And it says here that it was, if you're going to stay sane in La La Land, get a hobby and get one fast. So I'm so intrigued by this story. I would just love to hear more about how you went from looking for a hobby to being the passionate sewing personality that you are today. Tell us. Well, well, <laughs> La La Land is, is, is really the name for it, is the name for Los Angeles. That friend was Judith Light of Who's the Boss and Ugly Betty. I was doing a, a play with her and she knew that we were going to take a break, my husband and I, Rob, in Los Angeles. And she said, oh, I don't think that's the place for you. You better get a hobby because she knew that we weren't into the schmoozing life and the, the, the hobnobbing of the business. We were more into the creative side. And my mother-in-law, my parents, and my aunt all gifted me sewing accessories. I, I, I had a uniquely you dress form and a little singer featherweight and a pair of ginger scissors. And it just all sort of fell into my lap at the same time as this time that we were moving cross country. There were three cats, actually, in that cross-country drive. That was fun. Uh, that sounds awful. So thought, I'm sorry. It was awful. Three cats and two litter boxes in an SUV, in a rented SUV. Oh, my gosh. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a trip, literally. So we, we get to L.A. and we, we set up our little very inexpensive treehouse apartment that you know could actually see a tree outside the window that was so novel to me having lived in New York at that point for years and I just started I just started sewing I, I bought a pattern I laid it out on the bed on top of a comforter and I cut the fabric out thinking this is this is what you do there's a, there's, a, there's a little triangle there. I don't know what you're supposed to do with that. I'm just gonna leave that off. Didn't do any notches, didn't do any understitching, didn't, didn't do most of the things that you're supposed to do, but I still came out with something wearable. I don't still have that dress, but I came out with something wearable that I was proud to say that I made. Clothing to me has always been, it's been an armor for me. Growing up, I was very shy and being a mixed kid, oh, I was incredibly shy. My dad, outgoing, gregarious, instant friends with everybody he ever meets. And my mom is more quiet and reserved, but funny, funny. And my mother is just a superhero. But, but I took after my mom. I was more quiet and reserved around people. And I used my clothing as a way to speak to people to tell people, I, I, don't, I don't care what race you think I am. I don't care what you think about the things that I do. I, and I leave my clothing to say that because when you walk around in 18 different colors, it kind of speaks for you. And so when I started sewing, it was, it was like, oh, I can, I can really take control of it now. I can make my armor into whatever I want it to look like that I can't find in clothing stores. I can 
walk around LA dressed like the person that I am instead of the box that people are always trying to fit you into in the business. And as a person of color in the business, it's, it's a teeny tiny box. At every part that you audition for, the first thing that's said after the role name is the ethnicity. So you'll get, you know, um, Captain Krieg, I don't know, that you're auditioning for race, Latina, or, you know, race, black. If it says no race, then it means they're looking for someone Caucasian and it means someone like me isn't going to be seen for it. And so it's sort of, it's disheartening. And clothing was a way to get outside of the box in my shyness and outside of the race box, outside of the box of the business and just really be myself. And through sewing it, I just started, my confidence just started going up and up. And I was able to, when someone asked me, I, I love that dress, I was suddenly, I wasn't shy. I was like, well, I made it. I made it. You want to know about it? <laughs> and then I would point out all the flaws in it because that's what we do. But it, it, it helped me gain confidence. It helped me meet complete strangers for sewing meetups, you know? Wow. Boy, I lost track of where the question started on that one. But. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, it, it really, I love how it, telling the story of your journey is telling how it intersects with your background and your, your, your history and just kind of who you are. And that's a really, um, that sounds like that's a really important part of your journey into sewing. It is because clothing was always so important to me. It, it really was how I spoke to the world. I mean, because my parents taught both my brother and I that, that yes, you're different. You're obviously different. People look at you both as different, but that's something to be celebrated. And, and it's a wonderful thing that you're, my dad used to say, you guys are like ragu tomato sauce. It's in there. Do you remember that commercial? <laughs> they would say, is that spice in there? Is that one? It's in there. It's all in there. <laughs> there are things in there that we don't even know are in there that we're still finding out. Yeah. So it was always, it was always very important to me. It was way more than fashion. It was, it was a way of being myself. That's, that's lovely. I love that. Um, well, I mentioned in my introduction that when I first became acquainted with you was when you were a mood blogger. It was when I was first coming into, you know, I'm an old lady, Marcy. Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. I, you're I, a I, vibrant human being. <laughs> I learned about blogs and was like, oh, these things are really interesting. And that was, you know, what, five years ago, six years ago. I don't know when it was. It's, it's been longer than that. But anyway, so that's when I first became aware of you and several other people in the sewing community. And what's been interesting is that in the last probably maybe two years in particular, I have found myself spending less time in blogs and more time in Instagram. And whether that says something about my attention span, I don't know, because you know, you get so much more depth and so much more richness from a blog article than you do from an Instagram post. But regardless, that's where I find myself. So what I am curious about is if, I would love to hear about your experience as both a mood blogger and a personal blogger. And are you finding one or the other being more engaging today than say it was a few years ago? Mm -hmm. Well, I started my blog, Una Baluna, during that move to LA. And I started it for my parents, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm very connected with my immediate family. Una Baluna was a childhood nickname. And so I named my blog that, and it was a way to, you know, show my parents what was happening 3,000 miles away, because we had never been that far away from each other for such an extended period. And so the sewing blog, it became a sewing blog because that became the all-consuming passion. I mean, I used to bake, I used to paint, I used to make Christmas cards. I mean, but it, it all just went to sewing. And so that blog really became an outlet, not only to stay in touch with my mom and dad, but to, but to really fuel my creativity. I wanted to put more stuff out there, see what else I could make. Uh, and Mood Sewing, the Mood Sewing Network, came about because of that blog. They saw Una Baluna and wanted me to be a part of Mood Sewing Network. And I was like, I'm sorry, do you have, do you have the wrong person? Are you sure? I, could, I didn't say, I said yes so quickly. I shouted out to Rob, I was in the kitchen having a cocktail. I said, I just got this email. I, I said yes, before they could take it back. <laughs> so I, just, I couldn't believe it because the, 
the people that they had in that network, Erica Bunker, Carolyn Norman, Marina, um, Marina, couture sewist, uh, eventually Peter Le Pen was in there, but, but so many wonderful sewists. And I was surely, I think uh, Sonia of Ginger Makes and I were both like, we were friends before that. We, we said, um, we definitely are here by mistake. Definitely. But we're just going to keep quiet and maybe they won't notice us. And we'll just keep getting free fabric. And so <laughs> we're having a great time. I mean, it was really, really wonderful and really stepped up my sewing game because the nature of my business is competition. I mean, you're competing for work. You're competing for the same role that a hundred other people are competing for. And so I look at it as a healthy competition. You can't get too in your head about it because you're not going to get any role, every role. But you can look at it as, how can, I, how can I do this the best out of everybody? So when Marina would come out with some beautiful Pure lace shirt or Carolyn would have perfect French seams, I think, well, I need to learn how to do that next. And I would learn those techniques because of my fellow Mood Sewing Network bloggers. And so blogging for them really, really stepped up my sewing game. And I did that for seven years. And uh, yeah, I actually left the Mood Sewing Network. Um, I want to say it was, I want to say it was two years ago now. Uh, because eventually, and I do want to talk about this a little bit. Eventually, you look at the work that you're putting into something. And it's work that we love. We love to sew. It's a wonderful thing, but it's still work. And when you put 25 hours of work into creating a garment, taking the photos, editing the post, putting it up on a blog that's not even your own blog and, and putting all of that out there, eventually you start to look at the three yards of fabric versus 25 hours of work. And you say to yourself, you know, things are falling by the wayside. On Una Baluna, things were falling by the wayside. On my own blog, it was, it was starting to be, here's my post for the Mood Sewing Network. I got nothing else because I spent all my time on, on the Mood Sewing Network. And so as an actress, what I'm trying to do now is, is sort of help the sewing community and businesses understand that the advent of Instagram, which has really taken over the life of blogs and the life of the sewing community, it's wonderful for businesses and corporations, big and small, because it, it, what it boils down to is free advertising. So if you've got to find the balance of what can you do that allows you to still be you, Mm -hmm. and yet allows you to put out, put the presence forward that you want to put forward. Another mm -hmm. avenue of business that you have branched into is um, when, when Crafty turned to NBC Blueprint mm -hmm. for a time, you joined them to present ideas uh, for refashioning. And uh, you've actually given me a video clip of a trailer for the series. So I'd like to play that um, right now. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Marcy of Una Baluna. I am an actress and a singer and a blogger and a what have you. Welcome to my Technicolor universe. Here, we're gonna take off the rack and out of the envelope and make it into everyday awesome. So that was a great trailer and it was very, <laughs> very, Una Baluna with lots of color and lots of enthusiasm. I loved it, just like I love all of those kinds of things. But I wonder, would you tell us how your relationship with that um, series came about? And maybe you could tell us what was the most thrilling aspect of being a part of that? And maybe what was the most challenging part of being a part of that? Well, I loved doing those series with Blueprint slash Craftsy. The people there are wonderful. I, 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 I'm, I'm sad that some of them are not there anymore, but I'm glad that Craftsy lives on and the content lives on. So I, I got a call from, at the time, I believe she was the, the head of uh, program development, uh, Trisha Walsh. And she said, I'm calling on behalf, it was still Craftsy at the time, calling on behalf of Craftsy, we would love to 
talk to you about uh, maybe doing some content for us. And my immediate reaction inside was, okay, I'm going to have to feel this where I say I, I actually can't do this as a union actress because this, this falls under the category of, you know, video teaching can sometimes fall under the category of acting and business. But it turned out that I didn't know this, but that they were morphing into NBC's blueprint and that they were specifically looking at people like me because they knew that I, they knew I was an actress. And what they wanted were people who were comfortable in front of the camera, but who could also entertain in front of the camera. And <laughs> I mean, I'm just jazz hands all the time. I'm happy to entertain in front of the camera. <laughs> So yeah. they actually, thank you. <laughs> well, they, and they actually wanted it to be Una Baluna come to life. Uh, one of the directors there said that we would like it to be your blog come to life. And uh, the director that we ended up working with, James Clark, one of my favorite human beings, just had the same mindset as I did and as Rob did, because Rob is a part of the series too. He has the same quirky sense of humor. He's happy to go for the silly, stupid joke. And I'll tell you, it, it makes the two of us, me and my husband, nothing makes us happier than just being silly and trying to bring a smile to people's faces in the middle of everything going on back then and even more so now. So yeah. that's how those came about. The, the most fulfilling aspect of that show was the fact that Rob and I got to be on camera, he's an actor as well, on camera as a loving interracial couple, which at that point we had been able to do only once. So in the business, they will often say, oh, we want real couples for this. So please call in, you know, husband and wives or wives and wives, husbands and husbands, please call real couples in. And so we'll go to the audition, we'll be in the waiting room, we get inside the audition and the the casting director would take one look at us and say, okay, so we're going to split you guys up. Um, I'm going to put Marcy with this guy and Rob with this guy. And I would always end up with a, a black man for my husband. And Rob would end up with a Caucasian woman for his wife. Yeah. It, grace is huge in the business. And I'm, I'm hopeful that that's changing now. I mean, I, I see commercials now where there are interracial couples and it, it makes me so happy. Rob yells every time he sees when he points at the screen. He's like, there, there. Uh, so, so rewarding and wonderful that Craftsy slash Blueprint had zero problem with that and in fact wanted to showcase it. It, it. it just, it didn't even come up. It was just, well, you're a couple. This is, this is your blog. This is what happens on your blog. There's hijinks together. You do this. So that was so fulfilling and, and just a wonderful environment. I, I did those days we had a, a little location in Denver and there were about 10 of us in an apartment in like a New York sized apartment. So it was cramped quarters and nonstop slam sewing, just fabric flying everywhere and, and people coming up with crazy jokes and let's try this next. And it was just the best time. Um, I don't know if there was anything uh, non-fulfilling about it. It was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of hard work. It was uh, five weeks of pre-production, which I would do at home in New York. And Rob would help me going to the garment district and picking up fabrics. And I would be coming up with ideas. This is what will happen here. And, and then if you sew this seam, no, wait, that didn't work. But then when we found out things didn't work, you know, in talking with our director, James, we decided to include those things in yeah. there. Because it doesn't, it doesn't work out the first time. Most of the time, you know, mm -hmm. nothing... It, life gets in the way or or just you know your scene ripper has to come out several dozen times and we wanted that to be part of it we didn't want it to be perfect you know so yeah. i guess the non i guess the non-fulfilling hard work part was actually fulfilling as well <laughs> well that's great that's that's a great report report to be able to give about something that you've uh, worked on so mm -hmm. um, well and you in talking about the the crafty blueprint experience you talked a little bit about acting i'd love to hear i'd love to kind of go there with you the um you know like i am like so many other people that part of my pandemic zone out has been 
episodes of reruns because there's nothing new to watch. Mm -hmm. So you have to find mm -hmm. reruns that you want to watch. And so for me, that rerun episode has been NCIS. And just a couple of weeks ago, I'm sitting with my daughter watching yet another episode of NCIS reruns. And it was in season four and it was called the angel of death episode. And I look and there you are, my gosh. And I yell out, I squeal. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's Marcy. And my daughter, she's, she doesn't sew. She, she was like, who's Marcy? I went, she, she sews. That's, that's Marcy. And I was so excited. She was like, okay, yay for Marcy. I'm glad that's her. <laughs> but I was so excited to see you in another part of life. <laughs> oh, tell, can you, can you talk to us just a little bit about the acting and, and how you mix your sewing life and your acting life together? Well, First of all, that episode of NCIS was one of my favorite things to shoot. The fact that I got to see the angel of death as a nurse was just so much fun. And on a sad side note, that show, there were rumors that the hospital section of it was going to be a spinoff of NCIS. And so all of the people involved in that, in that two episode arc were like, oh, we're going to be on the new NCIS. We're going to be on a spinoff. And then everything went crazy. Donald Belisario left. Mark Harmon was like, yeah, there's too much ire. It was, it, there's a lot of drama in the business. All that said, so how sewing comes into acting? Well, with Blueprint, it, it married beautifully there. But, but uh, what started happening was I started, um, Rob told me I needed to stop trying to be whatever box it was that I knew I was supposed to be before I went to the audition, Latina or Black or Asian or, you know, Native American. He said, stop trying to check that box for them and wrangle your hair into whatever shape you think they want and wear whatever, you know, somber outfit and just, just go in and dress like you and just show them you and have fun in the audition. And that's when I, I really started to book parts that I was shocked that I was getting. When I, when I just went in like myself, I went in for one show. This was an NBC show that was only shown in Germany, actually. And I was supposed to be um, a very sad mother who had, her child had been kidnapped. It was terrible and I'm crying and I hate crying parts, but I'm apparently good at crying. Uh, I got it with my hair just wild and out like this. And I thought that was shocking. Now they didn't actually let my hair be free in the show, but I booked the job by being myself. And part of being myself was wearing something that I made to the audition and feeling good about myself. And it has actually, so in commercial work, uh, which I do a fair share of as well, actors are often asked to bring their wardrobe to set because the turnaround for commercials is super quick. It's, they've, they've got two minutes to get set up to make the commercials. I don't know why, I think it's because you have to pull people in from so many different places and it's not a, a set show that's already running, you know, it's a, it's a two day job. And so actors will bring their own wardrobe and then the stylist will pick from their home wardrobe or, you know, supplement it with things that they've bought. And this particular stylist for a Liberty Mutual commercial, I said, you know, why don't you take a look at my Instagram? You can see what's in my closet because I probably don't have anything you want me to wear in my commercial. I, I, I have no more, you know, sensible blazers. I, I just don't because there's no room in the closet. Well, she loved my Instagram. She had me bring about a dozen dresses that I had made and the creative team, you know, the, the, the ad team picked one of the, my handmade dresses to be worn in the shot. And so it's kind of fun. Like there's a few commercials out there now where I'm like, that's my by hand London Anna dress that I made all by myself. <laughs> I mean, no one knows it except us. <laughs> Lately, I've become a jazz singer. I guess, I guess in this year of 2020, which, you know, <laughs> the word we should never say again, people have a lot of side hustles. And um, at the beginning, well, at the end of last year, I embarked on my jazz singing career with um, the acclaimed jazz pianist, Ethan Iverson. He's, he's amazing. In the jazz world, he's like Ethan Iverson. Uh, he found me through the sewing blog. Really? I know. He, he, he found me through Una Baluna. Uh, we loved a jazz trio called the Bad Plus, which he was a founding member of. 
we started going to concerts and I started writing on the blog about the bad plus about how great this band is. Cause I, I almost never talk about actual sewing on my sewing blog. I talk about everything else. And so he found me through the sewing blog and we became great friends. And now we're doing a uh, Burt Bacharach jazz concerts together, reimaginings of those songs. And 2020 was supposed to be the year that we had a lot more concerts because New Year's Eve kicked it off. And uh, so we're gonna get back on track with that once everything calms down. <laughs> oh, well, all right, so on a more serious note, mm -hmm. speaking of 2020 and COVID, um, you wrote in your August 3rd blog, um, uh, and I'm going to read from it here. It says, I was attending on, intending on writing about why we took a break from New York, but honestly, I don't want to spend the energy right now. I'll probably wax poetic on it at some point, but suffice it to say, it had been six months of watching the world turn upside down from behind barred windows, and it was enough. When I read that, I just was like, yes, I... I resonate with that feeling. And um, so when one of my ASG friends found out that I was gonna be doing this interview with you, she asked if I knew more about why you were spending time in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And um, so I was just wondering if maybe you'd had enough time to recover enough that you might wax poetic with us here today and tell us more about that. Well, as you can tell, I, I, I will blab on and on about almost any answer to any question. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Fayetteville is my husband's hometown. And uh, the first time I came here, I fell in love with it. It's a little college town. It is so open and warm and accepting. Of course, every place has its dark corners and, and little instances of whatnot. But for the most part here, I've, I've felt more accepted than many of the places that I've been. And I've been a lot of places. Um, so that's, that's why we came to Fable because it was his hometown. We started off, we started off 2020 with a family health scare that had nothing to do with COVID. And it made us really appreciate life and where we are in life, where we want to be in life, where we aren't in life. Just, it just made us really appreciate things. And so you go from that feeling to suddenly the world is on lockdown when when you're it's almost like suddenly as, as soon as you're coming out of this dark time you're entering into a darker world time on mass and we really our, our apartment in new york really is on the first floor it really does have bars on the windows because it's on the first floor and so we were just shut in our apartment at the end of it i think it, it was six months that we were shut in the apartment and I would look out of the barred windows every day at some new, outrageous, out of this world activity that I never thought I would be seeing in Hell's Kitchen, at least not the Hell's Kitchen that it had morphed into. When we moved in 25 years ago, I saw that stuff for sure. But, but this was, this was um, people jumping on top of cars with their shirts off, throwing things at people, uh, people using uh, the, the directly outside of our apartment building uh, to create shelters and homes. And it was, it was depressing, it was rage inducing, it was, it was very many things. And, and the reason I didn't, the reason I haven't waxed poetic about it just because I don't think I can really explain what it felt like to look at our neighborhood crumbling around us. And I actually, I actually get teary um, thinking about it because I really, I love our neighborhood and I love Hell's Kitchen. And it was, it was really, it was deteriorating. And our lives were deteriorating because we were stuck inside a box. And as I've said before, I hate to be stuck inside a box. We were stuck inside a box looking at the world, only going out to get the essentials and worrying if every time we went out, that would do something to bring the health scare back that we had just gotten away from. And, and, then the, and then everything came to a head with George Floyd and everything that, that was, was happening. We saw, we saw some wonderful things too. We saw protests from right outside our window because we could see onto a main avenue, thousands of people shoulder to shoulder marching peacefully no, no violence. We, we would watch that happening and feel 
uplifted that that was happening, but also at the same time feel devastated that this still had to be happening and angry that the that a lot of the news was portraying it in a in the wrong light really and i got to a point where i, I have a sunny outlook I, I i really i just try to stay happy about everything but i got to a point where i couldn't do it and i i had to admit to rob that i i this is too much i'm i'm too depressed here i can't handle it i i felt that I felt that my presence on social media and the connections that I'd made with people and how open I am with my life made me a person that that people looked to to share the stories of what was happening and, and share personal experiences. And I did that in the hopes that it might reach somebody who who it might change their outlook on on a person of color or on how we all exist together in the world. But it became it became so hard to do on when layer upon layer of things kept happening and are still happening. Mm -hmm. And I just, I needed somewhere where I could take a break from that walk outside and actually be outside without throngs of people around and without worrying. And so we were able to say, okay, we're going to take a break and go to Rob's hometown and, and get our heads better than they were, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the city and and I felt like I was abandoning my my city and when we came out here I realized that it was right around the time that a lot of people were doing that and I thought oh maybe maybe I don't need to put that on myself that I have to explain to people why we left because I, I felt like I was you know abandoning ship and I needed to account for that and I think keeping your mental health is as important as keeping your bodily health. And it's something that we're all finding out this year, you know? Well, I think that we all felt that some, there were so many aspects of feeling it. And um, it seems to come in, for me, it comes in waves where it will be, I'll be, I'll be like, you know, it's gonna be okay. And then I'll have a week where I just wanna pull the covers over my head. And I can't bear the thought of trying to pick up a needle and thread or sew or anything. I've talked to so many people or heard so many people express what you're talking about. Um, and I can't imagine, as you described your front row seat, um, I could say, I'm, I'm breaking, I have to turn the news off. You're for you it was out the window so you either had to shut the window and just stay inside in the dark or you needed to go someplace where you could heal and i, I say congratulations to you for deciding to go someplace to try to heal thank you 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 just said that better than you just made me understand that it was it was a front row seat it, you couldn't turn the news off yeah. yeah and and i also feel i also feel incredibly well, incredibly lucky to be out here, but also incredibly self-centered to even say something like, well, everything was going on, it was too much for me and we had to leave. And when I, when I think about the really awful things that are happening in this country and to people, but you know, at the same time, we do have to take care of ourselves in order to take care of others. <laughs> We've talked about what's been for Marcy, I always like to end these fireside chats with what might we be watching for next, whether we're watching for it to happen in Fayetteville, Arkansas, or if we're watching for it to happen upon return to New York, whenever that may be, <laughs> what should we be watching for from Una Baluna in the coming months and years? <laughs> well, something, something that's happened here is uh, it, it took a pandemic to uh, finally get me to start my YouTube channel. And we have the space here and we have the, we have the space in our minds here to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we have been filming and editing and shooting and constructing our own videos now, which, which have the feel of the, of the refashion videos with different topics because because that was, it was Una Baluna come to life. And so I'm like, why, why don't I keep bringing that to life and, and, and do that here? And, and we're, 
it's what we want to do. We just want to make people laugh. And I, I think that these videos so far are making people laugh, which is making me happy. I, I kind of avoided YouTube for a while because I know that YouTube is a place where people love to thumbs down thing and type it type and hit send and rage walk away from the computer. But, but that's the acting business that I'm in anyway. I'm used to that. I'm used to people doing things like that. And if there are some people out there that we make smile, great. So that's what's happening out here and probably will be for a bit more because we're having, we're having a, a good productive time out here. And so we're gonna hang on out here a little while longer. Uh, upon return, the jazz concerts will be coming back. Now, of course, Broadway just decided that they're pushing opening back to June 1st now. And yeah, and Broadway in New York is sort of the barometer for everything else. Okay. I mean, every time Broadway has announced, oh, okay, we're going to push it back to March. Okay, July. Okay, September. Everything else sort of follows suit. And so being a Broadway actress, being a TV and film actress, there's not a lot for me to do right now in New York. You know, there's it's a lot of things that now are being done via video, via Zoom. And so people are pivoting and figuring out a new way to make that work. And if we can make that work from a home base where we can actually walk outside, it's, yeah. it's, a, lovely, it's a lovely and lucky thing. Well, we are going to be watching these YouTubes, this YouTube channel as it grows and flourishes, <laughs> as I know that it will. Um, that it can do nothing but that with you at the helm. You and Thank Bob, you. let's don't leave him out. There. <laughs> Marcy, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It has been an absolute delight. I've had so much fun spending time with you today and just hearing about your story. And when things go back to normal, and they will. They will. That's right, they will. When they do, if you and I find ourselves in the same city, I hope that we will sit across the table with a glass of wine again mm -hmm. and actually clink these glasses. Mm -hmm. clink, clink. With no worry about the clinking. That's right, in real <laughs> life, because I would find nothing more fun than to actually spend some time in real life with you. So thank you so it. much for joining me today. You're so welcome. Be well. Yeah. Until next time. Bye-bye.